Hi guys, it's Tony Robbins. You're listening to Habits and Hustle. Crush it. Today on the podcast, we have Dr. Keith Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a social psychologist and a professor in the behavioral and brain sciences. He is best known for his research and writing on narcissism. Dr. Campbell is also the author of several books, including The Handbook of Narcissism, The Narcissism Epidemic, and also his newest book, The New Science of Narcissism. Understanding one of the greatest psychological challenges of our time and what you can do about it. We had a really fascinating conversation on the topic. People be, um, use the word narcissism or he's narcissistic or she's narcissistic really kind of loosely these days. And we talked all about the differences between having a narcissistic personality disorder and just having traits of narcissism. Uh, narcissism. Uh, really fascinating conversation. I really think that you're going to enjoy this podcast. And uh, like I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed having him on the podcast and talking to him. So let me know. Please leave a, a comment, a review. Let me know your thoughts. Your feedback is always so important to making this podcast better as we go. So please participate in letting me know. Bye. All right, guys. Today, this is a this is going to be a good episode. I hope so. Keith, it will be. You got a lot of pressure on a you. A lot now. of pressure. It's going to be great. <laughs> we have uh, Dr. Keith Campbell. Dr. Keith Campbell is the leading, world renowned uh, specialist in narcissism. How do you like that? I'll take it. Right? Why not? You might as well. He has yeah. book. He, he has um, his first book was a. a a national bestseller called the narcissism, not sorry, the narcissism epidemic. His newest book is called the new science of narcissism, understanding one of the greatest psychological challenges of our time and what you can do about it. This is a topic. I mean, people love talking about narcissism. They do. Yeah. And 10 years ago, they didn't even know how to pronounce it Isn't and they still crazy? don't. I yeah. Know. But it just, it exploded. It's it, wild. It, why do you think that is? Is it because the fact that people are becoming more and more narcissistic <laughs> that they want to talk about, hear about themselves? I, I mean, I think there was, a, there was a generational change in narcissism, but a lot of that in young people has started to turn around. We're seeing a lot more depression, unfortunately. Right. You know, so after the great financial crisis, a lot of it has been social media and that everybody has to be kind of their own producer, their own celebrity. So you got, you know, 15 year olds out there selling them, you know, right. selling their image, selling their brand. So there's a lot of pressure that way. And then we live in this sort of celebrity culture. So there's that part of it. So I think there's a lot more interest in narcissism. Um, another piece is individualism and social isolation. You know, as we're kind of isolated and individualized as a society, narcissism becomes more important. We're not talking about our families and our groups and the bowling right. league, you know, we're talking more about ourselves. So basically because there's a less lesser focus on like community and yes. much more on individualism. Yeah, and individualism can go bad in a lot of ways and narcissism is one. Absolutely. Because now everybody is a personal brand, like everybody depends, not only if you're a company or a product, but a person. And like you said, we have to, we are all addicted to social media. So it's just, it's like rampant now. Right. Because you're out there doing it and you go, I have to do this for work. Because if I'm not out there doing my, yep. my social media work, my branding, everyone's going to forget about me. And then what am I going to do? I'm not going to have a job. I can't do anything. So I've got to work on it while everyone else is doing the same. So it becomes competitive branding. Right. For exactly. individuals. And a lot of us don't have that much to say. <laughs> you know? Well, that's the problem, right? And you're also looking at yourself 24 hours a day. And you know, also with these filters and not. So when you are not on a filter, you see yourself and it's, you become so upset and, and depressed. That is what we're seeing at the cultural level where you make a social media world, people who are narcissistic, who are self-focused, they're like, hey, this is my dream. Yes. I can have shallow, pe I can be shallow and have people pay attention to me and like me. And I don't have to reveal too much about my inner messiness. Right, right. And they're like home run. So they're out there winning. Right. And then everyone else is like, I got to play the same game, but I don't like looking at myself that much. And well, maybe I can make an image I like and I spend all my time making the image of Keith online and then I go home, like you're saying, and look in the mirror in the morning and go, who is this old dude exactly. looking back at me? Yeah. This is the most depressing thing I've ever seen. And then you're, you you get depressed. And so there's a real emptiness. A lot of times people talk about narcissism and, and emptiness. And I think that's part of it. Is yeah. You're just focused on an image 
And you're trying to impress people you don't care about, really, just trying to get likes or whatever. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's dark. I mean, this is crazy where our world now has become like how many likes or how many follows you have because other people are, um, I guess, what is it? They're um, they're judging you based on your worth on that stuff, especially if, you're, if your work is involved with that, right? Like you're not worth, worthy if you don't have a million followers or 500 likes. They or will it they is. will judge you based on your follower count. Yeah. And I will be judged poorly, I would like to say. But that's what, I <laughs> you mean, don't that's even what, have Instagram. I don't even have Instagram. Yes. I should. I have a fake account. I, I look at fishing stuff and occasionally. Only fishing it. stuff. Yeah, okay, so, fishing. And, and, uh, so you're not a narcissist then? I, I'm really not that narcissistic. I mean, there's that old saying, you know, research is me search. Right. And, um, <laughs> I like that. So, yeah. And and like, I got issues, believe me. But I, 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 I could be, I'm my self-talk is a little more negative. <laughs> really? know, I, I tend to struggle more with depression a little bit. Yeah. But doesn't, it, aren't there correlations? So let's start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think it's it, what, what I find fascinating about your books and about the research I've done, there is correlations between narcissism and depression, narcissism and like all this emptiness. And ent just yeah. because you're entitled or because what, let's first discuss what is narcissism at its yeah. core. Yeah. And then let's discuss, is that the same as having the narcissistic disorder? Yeah, go on. So yeah, yeah here's the problem with narcissism is first, uh, you know, years ago, no one could really say the word because it's a hard word. It's got right. an extra S and it should be like, and it really <laughs> used to be narcissism. And then they changed it, you know, in the old text, there's narcissism. And then it becomes narcissism because it's based on the Greek myth of Narcissus. Mm. And Narcissus was this you know, a beautiful dude, and he was looking for the love of his life. Um, the one person he fell in love with was Echo, the nymph, mm -hmm. who repeated everything he said, and she faded away. And then he, he ended up falling in love with his own reflection in water and dying and turned in. There's different versions of this, but he turns into a flower, which we call the Narcissus or the Daylily. Mm, okay. And so, and there's a Salvador Dali has a great painting of this. So this image has been around in art a lot. It's a hard word to say. No one could say it. And now everyone talks about it, but they don't know what it means. So right. they're like, yeah, my ex-boyfriend was such a narcissist. Why? Well, he's kind of a jerk. Well, narcissist is a little different than just being a jerk. A lot of jerks out there, you know, right. some are narcissistic, some aren't. So, People are using it uh, incorrectly. Part of the problem is there's really three ways we use the term in psychology and the research. The first is there's a personality trait. And the idea of a trait means we, we all differ on these traits. We all have some level of narcissism. Some are higher, some are lower. And there's costs and, and, costs and uh, benefits to both high and low narcissism. Within the trait of narcissism, there's two faces or two kinds. So there's grandiose narcissism. And this is the kind we, you know, I've been up in LA here, you kind of think of the, you know, celebrities and the politicians, and it's the, it's that extroversion and confidence and sometimes drive and ambition, fame seeking, attention seeking behavior. But that's married with a sense of entitlement, a sense of being superior to other people, a sense of maybe feeling you're just kind of fundamentally better than other people, uh, antagonism and some anger. So those two things together, you know, that grandiose narcissism is almost like uh, it's kind of like uh, antagonism with a really pretty face on it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you find people who are really just extroverted and attention seeking, but they're nice people. So they can be narcissistic, but they're kind of oblivious. And you talk to me like, and they're like, I'm sorry, I just wouldn't think it. You know, they're not yeah. bad. They're just self-centered. Right. And, that's and there, a, is a, there is a difference. Yes. Yeah. And that's this more grandiose side. And then the more vulnerable side is you have that sense of entitlement and sense of importance. I'm an important person. I deserve special treatment, but you're a little insecure. You have low self-esteem. You're a little introverted. You're a little fearful. So what do you do? You can't go out in the world and be successful because you're kind of scared, right? You can't go out there and be a celebrity because you don't feel good in front of the camera. You're like, but in your mind you do. So you end up with a fantasy world where you're kind of uh, telling stories about how great you are. In the book, I talk about, you know, serial killers, or I mean, spree killers, I should say, these mass shooters who write um, manifestos right. before shooting. And a lot of those manifestos is like, the world is unfair because I don't get the what I deserve. I'm gonna show you who the real alpha male is. So sometimes with this more vulnerable narcissism, you see people that seem really insecure and shy, but occasionally with the 
criminality, they'll act out to sort of show dominance. So is that one is is there is the vulnerable one more is it is it worse than the first one than the it, grandiose one? Yeah, so the grandiose is narcissism is 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 really pretty effective in a lot of ways. So if you're in a leadership position, if you're young, if you're in LA, you know, being a little bit grandiose works. It's going to make you work pretty well. Right. It's probably going to have a negative consequence on your close relationships over time because you're going to you're going to value maybe new relationships or celebrity over maintaining closeness and that might have a cost. But it's a bearable cost. And the people that are probably going to suffer from grandiose narcissism or grandiose narcissists are people who love them and want to be with them that aren't getting what they need. Right. Because they're, you know, they're, they're kind of signed up for a different relationships. So the narcissist is like, this is great, but I also want this and this and this. And the person who's more love focused, like, I just really want the relationship. Right. So that's going to be conflict. And then the other thing those grandiose people do is they get into a lot of power and then they can do damage and power. So they might go into political office or celebrity office. So that's that's where nar- grandiosity can get in trouble. So wait, hold on. I want to ask you something. Yeah, yeah. So the, between the so like a, you see like Tony Stark would be like a, an example of a grandiose, Very, yes. right? Because people who are also super likable, right? Like yes. They have very, like a likable quality. Absolutely. And research with narcissism, people are grandiose. If you meet them initially, you like them. Right. I mean, on average, they're just likable people because they're extroverted, right? Confident people you like. But then does it change over time? Because um, I like Tony Stark from Iron Man 1 all the way through, yeah. you know? So imagine you're married to Tony Stark. Right. And Tony Stark's you're like, hey, Tony, I want to take the kids out. And Tony's like, well, I've got my genius plan. Well, what is it, Tony? I'm not sharing you with my genius plan because I'm the genius. Right. I'm going to leave for three months and work on this. You're like, well, what about our marriage, Tony? What's right. about me right now? So on the surface, they're all fun and happy and you li- they're very likable. But in a deeper way it's, where- it- Yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Tell me. Deep, committed trust relationships are what fall apart. Right. So if you want a deep, committed, trusting relationship with somebody sort of shallow and self-absorbed, it's going to be a problem. Even though you go, God, that person's so likable. Look how extroverted they are and how charming and charismatic. I really like that Tony Stark. I'd love to be his bro, you know? Right, right. But you might not get that from him. Is there ever like... um like you could have some of it, but not all of it. Like you could be a deep thinker, but also be a grandiose. Oh, absolutely. So okay. these things, I mean, the way person, I hate to say it, but the way personality is really complicated. And you find people who are grandiose and kind of vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And those people can be really a problem. Because there's see, like that combination. Yeah, that combination can be really dangerous because they're really insecure. So people who, like Tony Stark, you're like, Tony, you're an idiot. He goes like, no, I'm not. You're right. an idiot. He doesn't care. He doesn't care because he knows he's smart. But right. if he was insecure, he'd be like, I'm not an idiot. I'm going to prove it. To you by killing you with a right you know, laser weapon. Wait, so there's three kinds. A grandiose is like a Tony. Uh, the vulnerable you says like like a George Costanza. Yeah, that's right? the kind of the, the kind of the more um, yeah inter- like self deprecating, self deprecating, a little depressive. Yeah, and so he's not dangerous per se. Those they can be, but usually they're not doing enough to be dangerous. Usually they're dangerous to themselves. So right. people who are vulnerably narcissistic or depressed, they're anxious. They don't feel they're getting a fair shake. They go to therapy for depression. And this is why they used to call it covert narcissism because they go into therapy and they're like talking about their depression. And the therapist in there after three sessions goes, wait a second, you really you kind of think you're a big deal. You're kind of a narcissist. Right. But I didn't know it. Because you, it's, it, it's kind of, it's kind of yeah. like... Um, a, like a hidden exactly. narcissism. You won't expect it. And then it comes at you. Right. Like, oh, wow. I didn't this know this. This person seems shy and kind of introverted and nervous. And I talked to him a few times and turns out they feel like everyone should be paying attention to him. And that's why they're not happy. So then who would be a combo? So what you find, um, well, somebody like Donald Trump is an interesting kind of a combo character. Or isn't you, he the one that, wouldn't he, wouldn't he have a narcissistic personality? So disorder? that's what I was going to say. I Well, that's a, it's a longer discussion that maybe- They got time. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is with the disorder, which is the third type of narcissism, when your, your narcissism is and your personality becomes extreme and inflexible. So you're very narcissistic and you can't turn it on and off. So when your kids come home, it's the birthday party, it's about you. You know, when is that the dis- the, is it, that's is when that, it becomes a disorder. So that's that's narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. Yeah. So when it becomes extreme and inflexible and then to be a disorder, it has to lead to clinically significant impairment. 
Meaning a psychiatrist or other, you know, clinician has to say, yeah, Keith, you know, your narcissism is significantly damaging your life in a couple of areas. It might be your relationships. It might be your decision making at work. Your ego is too big. You're not taking feedback. So you're not growing enough. Um, it might be your uh, cognitive distortions. You're kind of risk taking. It could be different things like that. So they come up with a couple of things. Often it's interpersonal. Your marriage is falling apart. You're Families mm -hmm. falling apart, your work, you know, get fired at work. If it's impairing in a significant way, it's inflexible. You've been like that since you're a kid. You're not just, you know, hopped up on cocaine or something. Um, <laughs> they would say, yeah, that's a disorder. It, it the way narcissistic personality disorder is described is it's primarily grandiose, but there's also some vulnerability in it. It's a bit of a mess. And, it, and that can be, a, again, it can be diagnosed as a disorder and treated that way. And an NPD or narcissistic personality disorder is like one to 2% of the population. Really? So this is supposed to- they all to, live in LA? Well, that's a, that's a <laughs> or joke, New York, right? Right? And they all live like, in New yeah. York and LA. Well, yeah. you imagine though, you're like, well, I'm somebody who really, I think I'm a really special person. And I think the world should know. Well, where are you going to go? Yeah, you're going to go straight to Hollywood. Well, you know, there's a, a friend of mine once said to me, and it's, I think it's so true. It's like in order to have to, to be super successful and really go after it, you have to have a, a bit of you have to have a level of entitlement yeah. to even think like, well, why not me? Yeah. Why not me? Like and the truth of the matter is like I. I think that I have that in me, right? Because that's, I think it's like, well, if it's going to happen to someone, why couldn't this X, whatever it is, yes. happen to me? Or, you know, why not? Like, and having that kind of like naivety, is it kind of, bore, is that like, is there like a difference? Or do I, you need to have that I think, entitlement? I, I call it naivety. Yeah, or I mean, it's- More than narcissism myself. No, I, I, when I look at it, my sense, it's like, I say like, I'm willing to do anything. I don't know if I'll pull it off, but I'll give it a shot. Right. And I'm I'm happy to try. Right. And so yeah, that's that that's risk taking, that's extroversion, and that's like an ingredient of narcissism too. Right. But it's ingredient of a lot of things. So that's an ingredient of boldness. It's an ingredient of, you know, uh, fearless dominance. That's another trait we talk about. Um, fearless dominance. Fearless dominance. So that's um that's a, a trait they describe psychopathy with, or it's an aspect of psychopathy, fearless dominance. In the military work, they talk about Audie Murphy, who is this great, he was the most decorated soldier in World War II, he became a Hollywood star. Oh, and wow, And okay. he was, you know, kind of the example of fearless dominance, just a bold, Chuck Yeager, the, the test pilot. Oh, okay. So yeah. fearless dominance is somebody who's got it's that it's the guts of narcissism, but not necessarily the ego piece. So Chuck Yeager's like, yeah, I'll go f kick ass yeah. and fly this feet of sound. And, you know, I feel good about it. But he's not walking around afterwards signing autographs going, hey, get in front of the camera. Let's talk about Chuck Yeager. Right. Right. Because he right. just wants to go fly the plane. Right. Because he's, oh, he's bold, but he doesn't need he doesn't need the fans following him around. Absolutely. I love the way you say bold because. You know, you're obviously, uh, you know what I'm doing with my life, with this boldness. Yeah. And my book that's coming out, like not for a long time. And I used you as um, obviously as an expert to help me with it. So where is is where is the boldness and narcissism? So boldness, do my hands, so yeah. boldness and extroversion and drive and ambition are kind of these, you know, I, we just think of vertical. Is that what you, sorry, I'm drawing a circumplex. Yeah. <laughs> a circum, imagine the circle, it's like yin and yang. Yeah. So, so boldness is that extroversion drive, yang um, energy piece. And that's really useful for success. It's important for leadership. It's important for getting anything done. If you have boldness and you're a nice, loving person, you're not a narcissist. You're a bold, loving person. If you have the boldness and you're kind of an entitled dick, a little bit narcissistic. Right. Boldness itself isn't the problem. It's when you the, combine the, the, you combine it with antagonism. So narcissist. The thing what, what that do you, what, what do you mean? You keep on saying antagonism. I, I know antagonism is a hard word. And you say it in the book a lot. I know it's so technical. So. If you take all of personality uh -huh. and you kind of put it into the, you know, big buckets, if we take all these personality traits, there's thousands of traits, there's boldness and confidence and cleverness and kindness and all these different things. If you put them all in boxes and say, how many traits are there really? There are about five, it might be six, it might be four, but really we come up with, and we call these the big five traits and they spell ocean or canoe. 
to make it easy. Really? Yeah. So the, the big five traits are, I just do this, openness to experience, uh, which is really about creativity and aesthetics and philosophy and ideas. And the C is conscientiousness, which we were talking about earlier, which mm -hmm. has to do with discipline and being organized and responsible and taking care of yourself. And that's a really important trait for health and a really important trait for wealth. Um, and then you have extroversion, which most of us think about as sociability, like I'm a social person, but extroversion and personality also means drive or ambition or energy. Mm -hmm. So there's that extroversion piece, agreeableness, which is about being kind, polite, and rule following. The flip side of agreeableness is antagonism, which is about being a little bit entitled and looking out for number one versus the group. So when I say, when I'm talking about antagonism, I'm talking about sort of the opposite of agreeableness. Got it. Okay. It's yes. sort of, it's meanness, but it's like being mean and self-centered. Difficult. Difficult is a good way to right. put it. Yeah. Okay, difficult. And then the final trait with the ocean model is neuroticism. And neuroticism is the old fashioned word we use for things like anxiety, depression, and kind of hostility, like hostile aggression. Mm -hmm. And so what you see with narcissism is if you take that drive, that extroversion piece, and you mix it with low antag or low agreeableness. So somebody who's not that agreeable, not that nice, not that cooperative, but really driven, that's more grandiose narcissism. And people like that are pretty likable people as long as they're on your side. And then if you take that, uh, that meanness or that antagonism and you mix it with neuroticism, with anxiety and depression, you end up with vulnerable narcissism. So those folks don't do as well because they don't have the drive. Got it. But they feel really bad because of the neuroticism. That's interesting. That's actually, now I understand that. Does that make sense? It does so make sense. I think about these things as the big five is kind of the ingredients, the basic personality ingredients. And then you mix those together to get different traits. I know? like that. No, that makes, that makes sense to me. So then um, what I'm curious about then before we move on to the next thing I want to really talk about is... Um, you were saying something about relationships, like how people have relationships with people like that. And you talked about something in the book about, uh, like the chocolate cake mm. model or something. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I, I, I come up with my scientific models and I, <laughs> I give them these silly names because a lot of science people give these names like, D dude, they're just models. These aren't mathematically specified <laughs> models. We're just trying to figure out how the world works. Come on. <laughs> So here's the idea with the chocolate cake, the chocolate cake model. What we were talking about earlier is if I meet somebody, if I'm driving around LA and mm -hmm. I met a celebrity right now, the person would be probably be confident and extroverted. And I'd be like, what a nice guy. I can't believe we got to meet. Like I was in, I was in Malibu Colony once and I met the guy from Police Academy, the star. Which I remember, one? Oh, Stephen Gutten? Gutten yes, yes. Oh yes. my God. I remember. It was so long ago. I, I love that movie. I, I loved I, him. I, I cracked up so much and this guy is driving with this yeah. surfboard. I'm out body surfing with these like weird, it's just a weird, I love LA. It's so weird. I, I don't even know. <laughs> it's true, right? Um, but you go, what a nice it's guy. It's reality. Right. So this guy could be a total psychopath. I don't know, but he seemed confident and <laughs> extroverted, attractive guy. I'm like, what a likable guy, right? So... So here's what happens when you're dating. You go out to the, you go out and meet people and you meet people who are grandiose narcissists and you go, God, I really like this person. They're confident, they're engaging, they seem really successful. And I really feel excited dating them. This is really exciting. And you start dating and it's great for a while. And then what happens in relationships, and this is cultural, but ideally, I mean, we tend to start with excitement. It's more sexual. It's more passion. It's more fun, hot. And then it becomes like, hey, let's get some commitment. Let's get to know each other. Let's look in a little bit. Let's think about our future. There's a transition. With grandiose narcissism, there's no transition. So you start dating. I'm start dating Steve Gutenberg. I don't know why I'm dating Steve Gutenberg. In this example, <laughs> I didn't remember his name. So I'm dating this guy and it's like, I, it's great. So much fun. We went to the opening of Police Academy 6. I got to meet, you know, the guy that does the funny voices. It was, this is the greatest relationship ever. And I'm like, Steve, let's talk about marriage. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm a freaking star. I'm doing Police Academy 16. They're going <laughs> to <they're gonna> premiere <laughs> it in Beijing, man. I don't need this. And you go, what happened? What? I, I, I'm so stupid. I thought I was in a normal relationship. So the idea of the chocolate cake model is when you give people a choice between eating a piece of chocolate cake and eating a nice salad or some broccoli or something, people go, I want the chocolate cake. 
They eat the chocolate cake. They feel really good. A great chocolate cake last night. I felt great. I was all fired up. Like, woo. 20 minutes later, I'm like, my, I get depressed. My the sugar high crashes. I'm like, why did I eat that chocolate You're cake? You're bloated. You You're feel blo- guilty. Yeah. I'm like, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that? Why was I so stupid to eat the chocolate cake again? And I'm like, dude, it's chocolate cake. Like, nobody salad sucks. You don't want a salad. But if you ate the salad in 20 minutes, you'd be like, I'm a healthy person. I eat salad. I'm a good person. So that's what happens in, in these relationships where you date these more grandiose narcissists. You get this big spike of satisfaction. And then they kind of crash. Right. And then it even crashes worse because you're like, what an idiot am I? Why was I so stupid to date that person? I'm like, guy's a narcissist. Of course he's attractive. This is what he does. Of course. I mean, he's an attractive guy. That's why you dated him. Right, right, right. So you get like, you get like kind of uh, pulled in, but then it never really ends well. Or it right, doesn't it really, is. there's never ever any meat on the bone. It, exactly. I, I used to call it the sizzle steak problem, but no one eats meat anymore. But it's the idea that it's like there's the sizzle in the relationship <laughs> yeah. and the steak and you get all the sizzle, but there's no steak. And that's what happens. So, so what happens in the vulnerable one, in the vulnerable narcissist? Vulnerable narcissists aren't that attractive. You're not really attracted to them. And so they don't do as much interpersonal damage as um, the other, as as the the other, other, other time ones, because yeah. they're, not, they're just not that attractive. So, okay, because a big topic is always this gaslighting. People are always yes. talking about yeah. gaslighting. So gaslighting um, is a term from an old movie where, you know, it was a... a husband, I think, making his, his wife crazy by, and he'd do different things. Like he'd change right. the lights and he'd be like, I didn't change the lights. Are you going crazy? The lights are the same. Right, right, you know, right. And so that's the idea of gaslighting. Basically light. screwing with your head. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a mind fuck. They're yeah. basically saying, you know, reality's, he, the person is changing reality. And when you say reality is changing, they say, no, it's not. You're changing. You're crazy. So, so you, what's, when, who does that? And narcissists when? do. No, I know they do that, but is that the grandiose nar- or yeah, is that more of a the disorder? It would be more grandiose and it could be the disorder as well. And is it common? It's, well, I'll tell you, there's no research on it because. Oh, it's, there's not? No, because I had a student who did all the groundwork for it and it just, it just hadn't been done. I mean, there's no really good measures of this. Um, So it's a way people talk about it. In the research, we've looked at game playing, which is similar idea, which is like in relationships and like, I'm really attracted to you and committed. Oh, you are? No, I'm not. Why did I say that? I was drunk. I'm sorry. Oh, I I said I didn't love you. I love you. That kind of. Yeah, that game playing. Is that so it's not really a narcissistic thing? Narcissists do the game playing because it's a way of keeping power and control in the relationship. Because if I'm in a relationship and I'm the one setting the rules, changing the dynamics. I have all the power. Right. So are they doing it intentionally? Yes. They are. Okay. So that's yeah. like, so that's an element of how, because I was watching something. I don't know. Was, I think it was your TED talk. I don't know. I was watching and I read all the comments and there were people who were like severely upset. Oh. Some of them because they are in these like really hard relationships. And, you know, we're talking about it now, like more on a, you know, frivolous level, but then there's also these deeper rooted issues when it comes to relationships and these people. There's a couple issues when I talk about, when I talk about everything, I tend to be pretty lighthearted about it because the world is so dark and horrible that I don't really see my choice. Right. And also it's not always, that's not the, probably the, the, the norm. Right. And with narcissism relationships, most of it is kind of small because most of us aren't with these psychopathic relationships. Right. But when you talk to people, and I've talked to a lot who have been in these relationships, they are horrifying and horrible and controlling and people will do stuff like the stories. I mean, the worst stories I've heard husbands do is they will, you know, they'll be married narcissistic husband goes, I want a divorce. I don't want to pay for it. So what I do is get my wife so pissed off, she's going to hit me. So I just I'll go there until she throws something at me. And then I call the cops. Cops show up and they have to arrest somebody for, for domestic abuse. Oh, well, your wife just hit you. Right. Oh, wow. Then you go to court, say, well, my wife's abusive. She attacked me. You mean you were a dick to her and she smacked you? Like, so that's kind of manipulative. Kind and, of. Yeah. And like, like it's hor- horribly psychopathic and manipulative. And this stuff happens, I don't say all the time, but I've heard this story many times. So is that a psychopath or is it? Narcissism and psychopathy are kind of like cousins. And when it gets extreme, you know, the difference is, you know, psychopaths, we usually think are like less focused on attention and have a little less or a little more impulsive. 
but they're very similar disorders, sort of like a lot of psychopathy looks like narcissism and vice versa. I had like Machiavellian and all this. <laughs> yeah, Machiavellianism that is a it's a personality trait that's supposed to describe really sophisticated manipulativeness, mm. like like in Game of Thrones, like the, some of the characters, like the like Littlefinger. There's some of the advisors that are real sneaky and manipulative. Right. That's what Ma Machiavellianism is supposed to capture. That's sort of just the manipulative part, but not so much the self centeredness. Because it's not, I don't need necessarily need to be famous. I just want to have control and manipulation. Right. And is that common in the grandiose? Yes, or? They, they related. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about the dark triad. I don't know if you've heard that. Yeah. That's down my, my list here. You talk about, well, uh, the, the dark triad and the light triad, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So what happened was people started noticing like, hey, we're doing research on psychopathy. And I'm, this guy's doing research on Machiavellianism. And these guys are doing research on narcissism. Well, they're all very similar. Well, what they share is they share that trait of antagonism or low agreeableness. So you take all these sort of traits that have to do with being a little bit mean and self-centered and selfish, and then there's different faces of those. So if you're just more manipulative, it's Machiavellian. Okay. If you're more attention seeking, it's more narcissistic. If you're more, you know, sort of just looking out for number one and maybe more impulsive, it's more psychopathic. But it's the same, it's just flavoring that, like, it, yeah. here are all the mean people, yeah. the mean, selfish people. And then you're labeling them. And maybe. then let's just try to. So what's, what's the, who cares? So, so all this is done just to have a label? Like, what's the difference? Well, I mean, the the it's these labels have historic meaning to them. Okay. So they kind of came up in different ways. So the people studying psychopathy, the people studying sociopathy, right. the people studying narcissism, the people studying antisocial personality disorder. And so people are doing these different things. They're all kind of the same. So we think of them as just cousin traits. They're not just little differences. I don't, right. I don't make a big difference over labels because right. these things are all on a continuum. Right. Um, so people are studying those things. And then what happened is you got in the clinical world, the world of psychiatry, and they said, well, we, we can't have all this. There's too much. So they had these political fights. And so there's no psychopathy. If you go to the DSM, mm -hmm. there's like the DSM-5, the, you know, the, the, the psychiatrist handbook, there's right. no, psychopaths aren't in there. Because They're not? They, no, because they Why? have, they have antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. And if you added psychopathy, it would kind of fit right across the two of them. So because of the fights, the oh. antisocial people won the political fight. So they got their construct in the book and the psychopathic people didn't. So then where did this all, that's so crazy. So where does this all, the behavior, these mental health behaviors come from? Is it from childhood, from trauma? Because what you were saying earlier, and I wanted to ask you, was about social media, right? Because yeah. with social media, even if you weren't so much a narcissist, it makes you more of a narcissist. It, it pulls for it and reinforces it for sure. Because if you're, if you were narcissistic, imagine you just two random kids in LA and one is like, you know what I really like? I like people who look at me and comment on how hot I am because I'm really hot. Yes. And the other person's like, I'm really insecure. I don't know how to fit in. I don't really like how I look because my face is a little fat. Who's going to be happier on social media? True, but then what I'm saying is, it, does it it kind it kind of creates a monster? So to speak. it's reinforcing. It's really weird. You For know, the people who are not naturally that way, the people who are narcissistic, it becomes very reinforcing of those traits. Right. So is the, it because how did they become narcissistic in the first so, place? Because kids are not normally considered to be narcissists, right? It's no. More, well, th so this is the thing with the, with kids. What you see is, you know, Freud talked about this is this basic narcissism with kids because they're, you know, your right. kids are like they're like I'm the best and look at my art. Right, but they don't know any different. No, that's how they're supposed right, to be, exactly. right? So the idea was in life you kind of start off sort of narcissistic and you get older. You're like, well, I can't be the most important because my other brother has to be and my mom and my dog and then in class and you kind of get smaller as a person and then you but you get bigger because you have relationships so freud talked about that um when but when you kind of look at all of it here's what you see is that there does seem to be some childhood and parenting and narcissism but it's not as much as anybody thinks maybe 10 20 percent of it mm -hmm. With grandiose narcissism, you see parents that put their kids on a pedestal that were spoiled them a little bit, a little more uh, permissive parenting. With vulnerable narcissism, you see the more classic pathological parenting, the, the abusive parenting, the cold parenting, all that kind of stuff, right. the, the more trauma. 
And, and that's why I think you get people who are both. Did you take somebody with the genetics of somebody who's going to be grandiose and you traumatize them a little bit? Right. And that's where you get the vulnerability, but that's another. Um, so those seem to be the two pathways, but those aren't a huge part of it. Genetics plays a lot. It, genetics plays more than 50% and about all personality, at least 50%. Really? For our kids, oh yeah. So like if your parents are narcissistic, the, a cha the bigger chance that you're gonna become narcissistic? Yes, yes. Interesting. Yes. So more than 50%? The gen I mean, I don't like to say like the chance of narcissism if your parents are narcissistic, but when they figure out how much of narcissism can be predicted from your parents or from your, your you know, your, yeah. your hi history, um, it's more than 50%. And this is true across personality trait. Most of how we are, we're kind of hardwired. So you have two kids, right? Mm -hmm. They're different kids. Yep. Totally different. Totally. And you never once go, you know, I could change you into you. You just couldn't. Right. You don't exactly. think that right. Like my daughters are totally different people. Right. And so as a parent, I don't get to pick who my daughters are. I already picked it because I married my wife and we spun the, <laughs> we spun the wheel and this is who we got. Right. right? So I have no control over who my daughter is as a parent. All I have control is how I'm going to relate to that. Am I right. going to try to meet her on her terms and try to help her evolve or develop in the best way? Or I'm going to say, you know, I don't like the person you came out at. I'd really like you to be more like me. And I'm going to make, change you into me. But so if you're narcissistic, though, there's a good chance that one of them, both of them will have a form of it. They will have the, they will have sort of the traits that could turn could into narcissism for it. sure. So. And then you go, what happens? Well, what can happen is you have the parent who goes, you know, my narcissism isn't enough, Jennifer, because I'm not as attractive as I wanted. I wanted to be when I was 35. <laughs> but my kid is pretty attractive. So I'm going to put all my psychological energy onto my kid's attractiveness in her modeling career. And I'm going to get all my ego needs met for my child's success. So parents will do that. Subconsciously, probably. Yeah, too, not, it's right? not. Yeah, they don't. They, right. and, and so what happens, and, and this is, I wish we had more research on this and we just don't because it's so hard to find the data, but you just talk to people and they go, you know, I felt like I had a really strong relationship with my narcissistic parent mm -hmm. as long as I was making my parent feel good about himself or herself, mm -hmm. you know, either one. Right, right, right. Um, but then when I got older and saw who my parent really was, that they were kind of fake. And I realized my childhood was a bit of a lie. You know, it was a bit of a, you know, I would say it's like a Western set. You know, it's like a Potomkin village, however you say that. It's like, it was a fake life. Yeah. Like I thought it was great. I thought it was happy. I thought it was this, but it really wasn't. And I was kind of playing a show. And then there's a lot of struggle that comes with that because you try to question your relationship, right. you question who you are. So, right. I, I mean, I think it can be a, a real challenge, but I don't, you know, and, and the, I just say, the, going back to the original question, the other piece that we haven't talked about is the culture. And it's just mm -hmm. random luck. So one of my kids can end up with one group of friends who's really narcissistic. They're sort of showy. And she might go down that path. And my other kid might end up with other friends who go a different way. It can also be cultural, though. Right. Growing up now with social media where... My, my niece's, I think my niece's food has more followers than I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I wouldn't be surprised. No, I mean, right. she, has, she has very wonderful food and people like to follow her food on Instagram. And so, it's, I love this I, world. It's so insane. It's it just, unbelievable. But you go back to like growing up in the 70s and 80s and like my parents couldn't even call me. Like I, oh, I, I know, you never I mean, phone, nothing. You never phone. I, I mean, it was just, it's such a different one. The idea of me being narcissistic, I'm like, how? What, I get them? I get on TV. Remember when we were kids, like if you were on TV, that was a big deal. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Now, totally. Now it's like, well, there's a million TV channels. It doesn't mean anything. I know, exactly. So the culture makes a big difference too. In certain cultures that are more individualistic, that are more low trust, um, the more urban, smaller families, all those things seem to pull for narcissism and cultures that are more collective, more communal, um, higher in trust seem to not pull for narcissism. But how do you, so what's, what's going to be like in the next 20 years, right? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but <laughs> things are all going towards more, there's, there's such strife in the world anyway, right now. Um, and it's just becoming going to be mayhem if everyone is such an ego. Like the truth of the matter is, before I even yeah. you answer the question, 
you know, being an entrepreneur, even in today's culture, is like considered to be super sexy and like the hot cre career. Nobody wants to work for anybody else anymore. They all want to be their own boss and they all want to be their own entrepreneur. There's th so like people are just kind of following into this I individualistic, yes. very much about one for one, not for one yeah. for all. One for know? one, not one for all. Right. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Is there going to be, is a pendulum going to, is like in history, yeah. does a pendulum swing back or? Well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I think it does because a lot of what we're doing feels like we're redoing the 70s. So I do feel right, there's right, some right. historical curves. Well, it started more, you said in the book. Well, no, what you said in the book, it's all started to get really kind of out of hand in the six. Was it the 60s? Yeah. 60s. Okay. So a lot of this feels like it really like in the 60s, people started noticing, oh, my God, people are so self-centered and maybe this narcissism is rising. And right. this is like 60s, 70s. And I mean, I can go, history. 70s people got very into themselves. We had a huge divorce, 60s, 70s. Um, people stopped caring about their kids. In 19, oh. 1980, 81, 82 was at the low point for child self-esteem in America because people were like, zero population growth. We got to find ourselves, forget about our kids. So the early 80s was about the low point for kids' self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And then we had the self-esteem movement in California that was in the 80s. I'm going ancient history here. Oh, wow. So a guy named Vas Kinsellis, who was a state legislator, legislature, um, he was in therapy, I think, and I could be messing the story up a little bit, um, humanistic therapy. And he thought self-esteem would be great for kids because if all the kids had self-esteem, they wouldn't do drugs, they wouldn't have kids out of marriage, they'd be doing, you know, they go yeah. to school, they get good grades. So they started the California Task Force on Self-Esteem and Social Responsibility. That was Republicans added social responsibility. They did this huge book in the 80s and they found self-esteem didn't really do much. Just didn't really seem right. to make that big a difference. Right. So the educator said, perfect, let's put self-esteem in the schools and that will solve all the problems. So they started adding self-esteem to everything. And this is now 90s, late 80s, 90s, where the kids are like, I am special exercises in class. We did this on purpose. So we boosted all the kids' self-esteem through the roof from the 80s, the 90s, mm -hmm. 2000s. And uh, what we didn't do was make the world any better. So we made mm -hmm. them all think they're going to be legends but then we made the economy worse and worse and worse. So right. they, you have all these kids that were raised to think they're going to be a big deal. And then they had very little opportunity, very competitive opportunity. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So what do you think about the fact then like when you're young, right? And I, the whole thing, like everybody's a winner, right? Like there's no such thing as, you know, like when they're playing soccer yeah. and these little soccer, they're like, nobody gets a winning thing or a losing. Everyone gets yeah. the participation. Is that good or bad for narcissism? I mean, you know, when we, Gene, Gene Twang and I wrote a lot about this in the narcissism epidemic. Yeah. And I thought about this a lot with my kids in soccer and stuff. And I think, I think competition and having winners and losers is probably good. And I think most kids, I'm very confident. I'm very confident I'm not the best in everything. And I think most of us figure that out pretty young and we're pretty happy about that. And also like teach the kid in life, there are people who are gonna win and you're not gonna win every time. And there are winners and losers. Yeah. I have a big problem with this personally, as <laughs> you can, can imagine, tell, can right? Just, yeah. You know, like I think it's so ridiculous at this point where these kids are like seven, eight, and it's like, no, I'm like, well, I, I walk in late, what's the score? Score, no one's keeping score. The, what the hell's a important point? In life, life I, is competitive. I, I know. and. Competition is fun. I mean, I, if that's a, then you're playing for a purpose, not right. just like, you know, like, may, or maybe I thought maybe I'm just because I'm that way. Maybe I'm just not, maybe I'm narcissistic where I feel like it's the, my way or the highway. I just think it's so silly. But like when I go for a walk, you know, there are people who think, I can just go lollygag and go for a walk. I like to walk for a purpose. Am I going to the grocery store? Where am I walking? There has to be a purpose behind things, not just to just do something. Is that, do you understand I mean, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I do completely. Um, you're smiling but the, at No, me. but that's, you're very achievement oriented when you well, say that. I mean, that's for you, you sort of saying like, I'm like, eh, that's achievement oriented. You're getting stuff done. Not that, every, has, that has nothing to do with narcissism. No, though. no. I mean, okay, that's good. a different, that's a different. Okay, good. Um, that's a different. You're kind of hitting it. You're, no, it's just, I mean, it, I think 
I mean, you're, you're bringing up so much. And I think about this a lot, you know, being a professor and having kids that are, you know, in college and seeing, seen it from both sides. And there's so much competition. There's so, but I don't even know what people are competing over anymore. Because right, like you said, true. everyone's like being an entrepreneur. Well, who are you competing with? Right. You want to be an entrepreneur, you want a network of people who are supporters. You don't want to compete with people. Well, no, but- the idea is because I feel like people don't, they don't want to have a boss anymore. It's just this yeah. new culture of like this individualistic thing. It's like, very uh, individualistic. Right. And, it's, and, again, and it's so, it's, it's it very, it's also very U.S. It's very oriented here. Yes. Like I just had a pod, did a podcast with this guy who's all about longevity, did the book, the blue zones. Right. And about like what makes people live healthy, happy lives. And, uh, Dan Butner is his name. And in all these, in the five blue zone areas, and the, it's all about community. It's about having friends. It's about working for, a, you know, for something more bigger like, than yourself, bigger than yourself. Yeah. And these are the people who are the happiest, live the longest, do the, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yet we're like losing a major facet in the world because nobody wants to do that anymore. No, but they, but it wasn't like people got a choice. So if you, could, I'm thinking about data out of China. So China, yeah. this very communal, very kind of Confucian society okay, starts to yeah. urbanize in the last 20 years. Right. Becomes narcissistic because they shove everybody in an urban environment. You say you get one kid, you can't yeah. have two kids and everyone compete. That's right. And narcissism starts going up and the people change. So you set up a very competitive individualistic world and people are going to have to be narcissistic because they're going to have to they're going to have to win because if you don't win what do you get well that's the well that's the thing and that's what's breeding in our country though that's what's happening so the people who are i hate to say it have that narcissism are the ones who are going to win right yes because, the psychopaths are going to win right because the, yeah, or the machiavellians right. or all the different cousins and everyone yes, else and they don't stop so the other thing you'll notice with very high wealth is that sometimes you'll see higher narcissism you also by the way Wealth, you see conscientiousness. Like there's nobody who's kind of lazy getting really rich. So these people, you got to work. I mean, I don't like conscientious. The idea. I think that's yeah, a very true I mean, point. discipline and stuff. So I don't mean like, oh, you're just kind of being an egomaniac and people are paying you. I mean, these people, you work hard for a long period of time to make money. But you see people who are wealthy or more narcissistic. Part of it is because if you if you got a great family and you, you make enough money, you're like, shit, I got enough money now. I can't spend all this. I'm taking my kids to Europe. Let's go have some fun, you know? Right, right. But if you don't have that and it's all about ego, it never stops. Right. So there's no natural place in there where you go like, yeah, I got enough. You know, yeah, I got enough. I got famous enough. I got enough money. Like, when does that kick in? Well, you tell me. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you you need it. Right. So usually the buffer is the social relationships. You go well, like, I want to keep my marriage. Right. The social I'm, relationship part is like, so it's essential, I feel. You're saying see, it's your guard to balance rails. out the narcissism. Yeah. But you don't, it's like a, a double-edged sword. How do you have a truly good relationship if you are a narcissistic person? But at the same time, if you are a narcissist, like it helps balance out the yes. bad narcissism. Right. Does and and sense? it. it, it it does. It benefits you if you're narcissistic to be in a loving relationship. It tempers your narcissism. It tempers your narcissism. It tempers your narcissism at the cost of the other person often. Um, Can but, two narcissists be together? Yeah. And that's what, we, you know, in the old, when we were doing like dating research, that's what you tend to find was the best. Like if you have two people that are kind of narcissistic, they're kind of shallow, but they're not going to hurt each other that badly. Right. Because they're both into their own thing. They're both in their own thing. I asked, she cheated on me. Oh, I would, why? Well, I cheated on her first. Well, do you think, it, well, fuck it. I, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's fine. Like, they're like, whatever. But the problem is you have somebody who's narcissistic with somebody who's really looking for a committed, loving relationship. Right, right, right. And they go, this person has, has everything I want. I just wish they were more loving. Because they're so successful and they seem competent. And so you're saying two narcissists are the best. That's the best combination. Well, I mean. But does it work? Because aren't you competing I mean, with yes, each other? Yes, but I mean. Because it's you're not attracted to that person because then there, they a, could be a reflection of what you're doing badly. So then it becomes really challenging with the dynamics. Because if I'm married to somebody who is a psychologist who studies narcissism <laughs> and we both think we're the best in the world, it's not going to be good. But right. if my wife can be an expert in something else that I don't feel is a direct threat to me. So what you have to do, I mean, this is called self-evaluation, but you kind of divvy up your success. So you go look at my wife, she's the greatest pro skateboarder in the world. Isn't that awesome? What do you, I don't skateboard, man. That'd be too hard, but she's the best and I married her. 
Right. And like, so that, that, I, does that feed your narcissism? Dude, my wife's the world's hottest skateboarder. Of course it feeds my narcissism because that's my wife. Right. So you get, you get like your, your, your it's pride. In yeah. That. So wife is like a Rolex or so, like a car. Right. Yeah. So then like does, but do all narcissists, like do, then why is it that not all narcissists do that? They, they a lot of times they date in their eyes, uh, maybe below them, below them because then they can shine. Right. Because the problem is when you're worried about your ego, you always have the choice. It's like, well, I can have this partner who is my level, but that's not going to make me look as good if I'm directly comparing to her. Or Unless to she's him. a totally a different, completely, completely different. different person. So, so maybe the safe thing to me to do, and especially because I'm kind of a loser anyway, is I get this kind of dependent, you know, wife who's been traumatized and I give her some options and I don't, and I make sure to gaslight her like the OJ thing and my, back to my LA stories. You right, know. right. Your LA stories. Um, we used to see OJ and like, we'd run through his yard when we were kids, like in, uh, where, where he lived near my aunt. Like, he had Bundy, that, yeah. yeah, he had that yeah. gate. We'd jump over and run across. You did jump. all that stuff? I mean, oh my this gosh. is when I was like- A baby. He was such a big deal at SC, you know? Oh, he's, I he know. He was huge. Huge. Was he be, would he be a, he's a narcissist. Oh my God, yeah. Because, I mean, he, off the charts, is he grandiose. A, is, he a, and is, he a, is he the disordered kind or is he just I, I mean, a, you know, if he did it, I would, su I would suggest being imprisoned and murdering your wife is probably, if he would, did it, but allegedly. But that would be the psychopath. That it's, wouldn't be an art. Like, well, that's what, I'm saying, fine what line, I'm saying is it, when it's that extreme, you'd probably say it's a disorder, whatever it is. Right. But we wouldn't have... We wouldn't have known that. You know no, what I mean? You, the thing. No one ever knows that they're, they're a psychopath a, until it actually happens. No, you thought OJ was the greatest nice guy, guy ever. Guy yeah. World, and he right. did those Hertz ads where he's kind of made fun of himself. Yeah. And you're like, look, he can even take a joke. He's not a narcissist. Right. He's a pretty likable, successful guy. So just because someone's self-deprecating doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a nar narcissist. No, they might have a good publicist or right. they might Or might no, be in general, like maybe they're smart enough to know how right, to- Right, they know to, 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 yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. So, I, and I, because I thought they were, but it's, it's, okay. it's impression formation. They're very good at impression management. Impression, that's yeah, that's the grandiose the, ones. Yeah, so it's, if you're if they're really smart about impression management. So if you're if you're narcissistic and you have a lot of self control and you kind of regulate it better. But then over time, you're not going to be as narcissistic because you're going to spend all this time going, I got to be humble a little bit just so the surfs right. like me. You know, I got to. So like the conditioning. Yeah. So you can actually, con so, is, so can, can a narcissist get better? I, I think so. So what we found in personality, this is sort of the big history, is you go back to Freud and Freud's like, yeah, this stuff's pretty much done by the time you're six. And then you maybe go to therapy and try to change it. And, right. And like, well, that's not so good. And then William James, a little later, is like, no, nah, I really got to 18, 20, you know, you can, and then it gets sort of set in plaster. But before then, you can move around. Now what we know, and this is, I think, a really, I'm really benefit, benefit of the personality science is we know people can change their personalities. And we know they're different. Is that true? Yes, yes, 100%. And we know- Because we always say people can't change. Right. People can change. They're core. They're people core. can change. And we know that people want to change. So when I ask my class, and you know, I always ask on those big five traits, you know, who wants to be more open? Who wants to be less open? What generally people want is they want to be more extroverted, less neurotic, more agreeable. Um, but primarily they want to be less neurotic, meaning be happier and be more extroverted. Those are the two big ones people want. Um, and so people do want to change. And when people want to change, they can change. It just takes effort. The problem you have is when you go, can you make somebody else change? And the answer is no, you can't make somebody else change. You can't make yourself change very well. Uh, so if somebody, okay. if you said to me like, Keith, who do you want to be? Well, I just wish I were a better parent. I wish I were a little more loving with my kids. I wish I could just have a little bit longer fuse, you know? Like I, I do. And I've been working on that my whole life. It's not a home. I haven't got there yet. You haven't even knew no. all your experience. All my experience. I try to be a great dad. Not there yet. No, Wait, my really. Kid, Are you getting no. better? Yes, of course I'm getting better. You know, I'm I'm improving. So it's all about an improvement, not necessarily. I mean, it but just, at your core, are you different? I think I'm different. I think I've really worked at it over time to be. I mean, I was very like we're talking. I was very achievement oriented and very competitive, and I've dialed that back a lot. Um, but did you only dial it back because you know, with age and like kind of like uh reflection later on yeah I, I think some of it was well 
I mean, I'm getting personal, but I think some of it is I just burned out too. I just yeah. got too, I was just doing too much and it just, I got to the point where like my nerves, I just couldn't. You, you couldn't know, do I, it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. So do, does someone need to have some kind of life situation where that forces them to change or, because if things are going great, right? Yes. You don't have any real reason to no. change, right? No, that's the problem. So the reason is it's like, if you tell somebody to change, they're like, nah, I'm feeling pretty good. So somebody's narcissistic and like, I'm pretty successful. And my wife's like, you should change to be a better parent. Like my life's kind of killing it. Right. So I'm not really- Even gonna, though your life could be shitty in the personal side. Right. You but you're like, it. yeah, I wish my personal life was better, but that's not my priority right now. Yeah. And I'm pretty good. And I don't want to give up this other side to get the personal life better. You right. know, I don't want to give up my ego to make my personal life better. So it's hard to make people to ch make people change. Really can't make people change. People though will change. What you're talking about is kind of that, you know, the rock bottom thing we talk about, or you're in a marriage yeah. and your wife's like, look, I'm leaving you if unless you. you. So there's often that kind of, you know, ultimatum that will seek people to but change. But even, I don't, does an ultimatum, uh, ultimatum work? I don't think it would because Man. it's like, out of fear, you'll do it because you don't in the moment, but then won't you revert right back to how you were? Well, I guess it depends on how much the fear so is. So you tell me, what are the strategies to for, for a narcissistic person to change? And honestly, strategies for anyone who's a neurotic to change yeah. or a, who, whatever their so, issue is. So with what we change mostly personality wise is neuroticism because that's what most mental health is, mm -hmm. is I'm kind of neurotic and they might say, Hey, it's manifesting as depression or anxiety or hostility, but it's all kind of trait neuroticism. Right. We want to bring that down. What can we do? Well, we can give you SSRIs. Right. That uh, will change your personality. That's drugs. That's drugs. Right. We can give you ayahuasca and <laughs> that could possibly, that will, I mean, on average, that lowers neuroticism about as much as SSRIs, but you only have to, you know, one And it session. lasts forever? Uh, the longest follow-ups we have are three months, maybe six months. And then and does I, it kind of go back to- I think it usually will cycle back, but I don't, I think it depends on who it is and what the- and The we situation just don't have, We don't is. have great long-term data. I mean, we just don't have follow-up right, data have any for data. years. So that works. Um, all sorts of therapy work, but when you look at therapy, you're like, well, geez, it all sort of works. If you have, a, if you like your therapist and stay with it. Right. And if you go consistently. If you go consistently and do the work. Although, honestly, a lot of people I know go to their therapist and they just talk, talk to them it, yeah. for five, 10 years and nothing. And, and nothing just like, happens. They become like, they're like, buddy, you know, buddy. Yeah. That they bounce ideas off of and they're yeah. not changing. I mean, I've seen people who've gone, gone and have had great results as well. But yeah. So then I guess. These are all things that I, you know, the strategy. Give me some strategies that I haven't heard of. So, if I'm if I'm narcissistic, what I want to do is figure out what the issue is. Is it my ego is just too big? I talk about myself all the time, and maybe I want to figure out what those are and really work on that specific behavior. So, I it might be like for me, I'm very extroverted. I will go to conferences, and when I talk about it. Somebody will say, I'll say like, hey, Jennifer, what are you working on? You'll be like, I'm working on this. And I go, oh, what about this? What about this? Blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, I'm talking for 10 minutes. And poor Jennifer, who's not as extroverted as me, is just not saying a word because my, my energy is too much. So that's not narcissism per se, but that's my extroversion messing up relationships. So I go, okay, I got to watch that. So right. what do I do? Well, I go, every time I talk to somebody, I breathe and let them have a moment. But then you have to be super self-aware. Yes. So I have to make it a committed behavioral intervention. Like I have to watch my, and if I were serious about this for real, I would have a diary and I'd be a journal and I'd have notes like, oh, so I'll do it. Like I, one of my issues is when, I mean, it's going through TSA, couple of days ago, okay. I had a lovely snow globe for my mother that my wife thought she would like. What's TSA? T to pre uh, security at the airport security. Oh, TSA security. Yeah, so I'm oh, going okay. through the airport. I get through the huge line. I get there. They open up the snow globe and say, uh, you can't bring the snow globe on the plane. Are you insane? It could be a bomb. Well, of course it could have been a bomb. I didn't think about that this morning. So I thought, well, I could get really mad and act like a baby, or I could smile, say Merry Christmas, and walk backwards through the line. And yeah. I'm like, I did that. I smiled and said Merry Christmas and walked through the line and just didn't get arrested. 
That took a <laughs> lot of work. You know what I mean? I just didn't get arrested. I didn't yeah. get arrested and my mother got the snow globe and it was a great Christmas. I've been working on that for years. How did you get to that? Yeah. So what, so you basically. Just being just over time. And I started learning meditations. It. Like when I drive, it's like, God wants me to be slow. It's like, this is something I got from yoga. So I just said meditation. It's like a little mantra I tell myself. These are just basic behavioral interventions that you do just for a very specific thing. So for me. It's more when things don't go my way, I get pissed. So I got, I got to stop that. It's entitlement. It's narcissism. I don't like it. Um, it could be antagonism. Could be you're just a mean person. You could say, you know what? I'm going to try to say positive things about people. So one of the things that's really, you might notice this in LA. I don't know, but it's very hard when you go like, hey, I had this great success. People don't go, hey, great, Keith, great success. They're all like, you, you know? And, and so a lot of times people's first reaction is like, damn your success. It's hard to make, it's hard Isn't to sell. Isn't that called schadenfreude? Uh, it is. It's so. It's they pretend of, they're yeah, happy for yeah, you. Yeah, it's though. like sort of taking joy in Keith's suffering would be sort of schadenfreude, <laughs> you know, the classic German negative stuff. And may, and telling Keith he's great when he succeeds is what we'd in psychology call capitalization. That's kind of a silly word, but that's, okay. the, that's the technical term. Like, hey, great job, you know. So one of those things you can practice is being sort of positive about other people's success. And if that's really hard for you, just practice it. Yeah. So if somebody goes, hey, I got this great thing. You go, great. I'm really happy for you. But what you're saying is that you got to, first of all, what I'm, what I'm hearing is you not have, you've got to first have the ability to be self-aware. You got to figure out what the what issue it is, is. What the issue is. Then you got to just practice it over and over again. Yeah. Until you get better at yes. it. Yes. Okay, it's so practice. there's no, there's no, there's no magic trick then. No, I mean when you find extreme personality change, we call it, you know, quantum change or something. And yeah. the, the times you see that, sometimes in war, where you get PTSD, so people have these tr war traumas and they'll right. come out of there. So, you know, and, and they'll be a different person when they come back from war. So that's like a classic example. The opposite side of that would be something like ayahuasca or the psychedelics, where you have a mystical experience. And having a mystical experience, people can come out of that, be more loving, more connected. Um, we're not really seeing narcissism change with psychedelics, you know, that neuroticism pieces. Right. But the, it's grandiosity. Sometimes it's taking people who are a little insecure and they come out and they go like, you know, I could do more with my life. What is okay. it called when someone like, you know, um, when you have something to prove, right? Like there are people you saying you were saying before how. You know, when you grow up with like a lot of rich and tattled people around you, and then like what happens a lot of times is people can then, you know, kind of grow up with a chip on their shoulder, right? Where they feel like, well, I'm going to show them, and then they push super hard, and then um, is that like a form of narcissism though, mm -hmm. or you? What is that called? It's not. No, I mean, the, you're the, right. Like, not everything is narcissism. No, and no. Everyone just uses that. Right. Word. They're using the term. I mean, narcissism is a is a constellation of you know traits or personality processes that make you seek ego and seek attention and try to be better than people, and it's a way of regulating yourself so you're the star of your own show. Um, but if you're like a kid and that you're, you know, I went to prep school and I, I was like, I went to school with the Kennedy kids. And so people are like, oh, you're a big deal. I'm like, no, I'm not. Right. Compared like, to per all perception. All, and then you get to this point, you're like, there's always somebody richer and smarter and better looking than you. Yeah, and I absolutely. figured that out very young. And I think a lot of people figure it out when they're older. So I think I was blessed in a way that I never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what you're talking about is, uh, I mean, this is. This is kind of like Eldorian psychology, um, <laughs> but the idea that you you kind of get knocked down, you go, I got to prove who I am because my I had a sense of who I was. I went in this location. I said, Keith, you're not that. You're weak. And right. I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to prove to everybody who I am. So that's a way of, I mean, we call it self-regulation, meaning I have an idea of who myself is. The world has told me that that isn't, my, you don't, no one sees me that way. And I have two choices. Either I can say, you're right, I'm a loser like the world sees me. Or I can say, no, I'm going to prove to you that I am who I say I am. And I have to build a person and compete and rise up to, to gain that status. That's totally normal. Right. I mean, right? If you went to a new school, you got you to gotta establish who you are. I mean, so this is sort of a normal thing of establishing identity. So I, I think that's- Well, you said something that you said, uh, self-regulation or self-regulate. 
isn't that more of a mental health issue when someone can't self-regulate? It, so the term self-regulation is a general term for becoming the person you want to be and staying the person you want to be. So if I have an image of myself and I want to keep that image, I do certain things. It's normal thing to do mm. because if I, you know, we all think we, we live in a stable society with stable, pretty stable society with pretty stable relationships. <laughs> and we have an idea of who we are and we go, I'm confident who I am because every day I get the messages. Well, if we move to somewhere in another country, mm -hmm. you know, we move to, you know, North Australia or Papua New Guinea or I don't know where we're going. Maybe we go to Japan or whatever. And we start living there. We don't know anybody and no one's giving us feedback. We pretty quickly know we don't know who we are. Right. Because where's the feedback? Who's telling? Everyone's like, who are you guys? I'm like, I don't know who I am. So we have to, we have to self-regulate. We have to establish who we are. Got it. I so see. there's a real social part of doing that. Right. And it's who your friends are. It's what you do. It's the symbols. It's how you dress. We dress a certain way so people treat us a certain way. If I'd showed up here in a three-piece suit, you would have thought a different, you would have thought totally it was a different true. person. Yeah. Uh huh. So we do a lot in our life to create an image. And we also want everyone to know the image so we don't have to negotiate all the time. We right. want people to get who we are so they don't treat us differently. I'm pretty informal, so I always look informal. Yeah, so I don't me too. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, so, but you do that for a reason, right? It's self-regulation. So what, what sometimes people use is a more specific term, which is self-control, which is like I can stop myself from doing things I shouldn't do or do things I, I, I know I should do. And that self-control is really important for mental health. So a lot mm -hmm. of our issues are drinking, drug addiction, eating, exercise, um, sex addiction, any of those things are self-regulation or self-control mm -hmm. issues. So that's why it's so important for mental health. Because if you can't control yourself, you can't, you know. Yeah, you, you can't you're function. Screwed. Right. You can't function. Right. Then yeah. what is... Um, you said, uh, what is this whole um, approach versus avoidance? Okay. Yeah. So if f fundamentally as humans, but this is across mammals and it's across other species as well, other kingdoms. I mean, this is a very foundational way of motivating is there's two motivational sets, sort of like gas and brakes. Okay. That we have approach orientation, which is I want goals. It has to do with getting goals. It's acquisitive. It has to do with feeling good. It's linked to extroversion. It has to do with reward seeking. And there's avoidance orientation, which is avoiding punishment. It has to do with finding peace and, and avoiding turbulence. Mm -hmm. It has to do with risk uh, avoidance rather than risk taking. And so approach and avoidance are two very basic ways. And we all have approach and we all have avoidance, but right. people that are more approach oriented tend to look for rewards. They tend to be energized by rewards and they tend to go through life one way. And people that are more avoidance oriented are kind of looking at risks and they're trying to keep safe and they're going through life another way. Right. So that basic motivation, when you move it into the self, so I'm kind of getting yoga here. I'm taking that. These are social psych models doing yoga. So you take that basic motivation, you move it into the self, the ego. What happens? Well, approach oriented is about getting attention, being better, fame, status, success. It's equivative, getting dates, you know, new dating partners. Um, and avoidance orientation is avoiding failure, avoiding shame, avoiding guilt, avoiding getting in trouble. Right. So it's different. It, these are different motives when they get to the ego too. Okay. With narcissism, with grandiosity, you see a lot of approach orientation, okay. which is, hey, this is my chance to shine. I'm in LA. Hey, I got to go. I, I can go meet, uh, you know, I don't know. I can't even remember the names. <laughs> and uh, an avoidance orientation is more, I don't want to get busted. And you're not, you're going to see that with more vulnerable narcissism. The vulnerable so, narcissism is more about don't find out, don't find out I'm a loser, don't find out I'm weak. And the grandiose is all about Check the- Check out how awesome. And the other one is all about approach. Yeah. So then I'm going to ask you one more question and then we can wrap this. But like what careers would you say are careers you would find like the in the in the vulnerable uh, and and the grandiose? So with grandiose narcissism, you find it- linked to things like leadership, especially so grandiose narcissists rise to leadership, emerge as leaders mm -hmm. in a lot of situations. Um, entrepreneurship, we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you see more entrepreneurship with grandiose narcissism. Again, it makes perfect sense. I got to take risks. I think I can do it. And I've got to convince people to support me. So those are areas that pull from more narcissism. 
Um, and grant and vulnerability doesn't really do well anywhere. Like there's no place on earth, like, you know what I really need is somebody who's self-centered and insecure. Right. Like, and I, I mean, you just, it's not, but you a, could have that in the grandiose also, just because someone is, yes, grand- you can have that wrapped up and they kind of, cover. yeah. Yes. Well, I feel like, yeah. you know, when you're talking, I feel like most narcissists I know, like real narcissists have are both. super insecure and they're just like, you know, they puff their chests out and they could be super, you know, uh, extroverted, but still be like really insecure in the they inside. They can be both. Yeah. yeah. And that's where they get into trouble because they're doing all that reassurance seeking and they're making sure people are supporting them. And validation. They, validation. That's a good word. You know, yeah. like. Yeah. That. Um, so here's the question I'd ask you. Do you really think these people and I'm thinking L.A. people are insecure? So if I'm a yes. successful person, but they're they're out there doing I stuff that takes a lot of security. So too. I think that people I mean, I'm not the world renowned psychologist, but I will I mean, say I'm this. I'm just making stuff up. Okay, man. well, I, this, <laughs> this, I'm doing it all by observation. I will say, though, I think I'm okay at it, but I think that a lot of times people who are really insecure try to overcompensate by showing a really, a really like bravado, bravado of like uh, of confidence yeah. and, you know, yeah. extroversion, but really deep down, they are insecure and they feel really depleted and they need constant outward validation and external, like yeah. a lot of people who need to go out all the time and, and seek validation. Yeah, they have all those qualities you're saying. They are super yeah. gregarious and extroverted and fun, and but they're also like deeply broken inside a yeah. lot of times. So that is i mean that's something we see in in research and we talk about this a little bit like the mask model of narcissism this is the old term we it was the old i used to call it tootsie pop model yeah. it's sort of a freudian model but the idea is that there's this insecurity and then there's this shell of confidence on top of it and the way you get narcissism you take insecurity and add confidence and when we look at people and you say, hey, are you wearing a mask? And people will say, some people are like, yeah, I'm fake it till I make it. Right. I'm insecure, but I got to look confident. Other people are like, nope, not at all. Right. So the people aren't where there's two kinds of people not wearing a mask. There's people who are just really insecure. Like, no, nope, I'm just insecure through and through, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm insecure. And there are people like, no, I'm secure. I'm just not that insecure. Really? Yeah, I'm childhood is okay. I'm wired okay. I don't feel bad about right, stuff. Right, but there's the other group. Right, but then there's the other groups. And right. then you get those people that are both very kind of grandiose, but they're also insecure. And that's why I think you're getting grandiosity and vulnerability. So that is a real phenomenon, but that isn't the that isn't the base case. I think that is well, maybe because I live here. <laughs> That's why I really in curious Los what you're Angeles, saying. and I think I see a com- the combo. I think yeah. people here are also like you get a melting pot of people here who didn't feel worthy or belong, and they come to Los Angeles, they come to New York, and yeah. try to like reinvent themselves because they have a. It's an like, island of misfit toys. Like they feel, well, they feel like broken somewhat, you know? I don't think that that's uncommon. I think that's very common. No. And and again, I think that's, I think that's a very real phenomenon because you've seen it. I've seen it. Um, but I don't think that's the base case. Meaning if somebody says like, hey, you're narcissistic, it doesn't mean you're a broken person who was out there trying to get attention. So even me, though, yeah. yeah, even though when I talk to people in LA, I'm like, yeah, you should see. It. <laughs> I mean, yeah. people they are out there trying to get attention because they feel that will heal something missing. And I talked to, you know, gym guys and they're like, yeah, a lot of these guys lift because they're really insecure. And that was their way of, you know, fake right. until and, they make it. Or feeling confident. And they feel confident. And then or after- building confidence. And after they do it for a while, the insecurity kind of starts to go away. Yeah. You know, they fake it till they make it. So that model is a very real model. Um, Maybe it was because, you know, I'm in L.A. and mm-hmm. I'm around New York or I'm these yeah. big metropoles. So, like, maybe yeah. like we Two were years. saying earlier, like, it's just like such an influx of those the, that that type the, of person. Yeah, it's a big you know, selection effect. Of all here. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's people are narcissistic, but they also felt like they weren't getting what they needed at home and needed to go somewhere else to get that validation. Right. Um, Which I think is like, and I think. So, so I'm sorry. So, there's a old story is Dr. Drew, you know, from Love yeah. Lines. Yes. 
gave the narcissistic personality inventory, which is like our classic old school measure of grandiose narcissism. He gave it to 150 thereabouts. I've mm-hmm. looked at the paper in a few years, celebrities on his show. And he would just give them the test and he, he, he did it really randomly. So you could never go back and figure out who these celebrities, which is great. I mean, it's, it's so hard to get these data. Yeah. And when you look at it, you found that there was a lot of grandiosity in, in mm-hmm. celebrities. It was higher. It was interesting. It was highest was like women in reality television, you know, mm-hmm. it was, and it was a lot of it was vanity piece, but it was, so you did find it. Um, comedians had kind of high narcissism scores, but the highest was reality television. So it was the le- less talent, more narcissism. Uh, yes. And, but we don't have vulnerability scores. But when you look at Dr. Drew's book, he talks about vulnerability all the time. So my guess is in this population, there's a lot of vulnerability, Mm -hmm. a lot of addiction, a lot of substance use disorders, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I just don't have data on it. I don't know how to get it. Well, I think also what you said, um, again, because where we're living, but you said something else I found interesting about um, what you just said. Now, I I just totally lost my It's okay. It happens all the time. What was I going to say? Well, I mean, I can't remember what I was going to say now. But it doesn't matter. I mean, I think I basically you've answered all of my questions. Um, the only, oh, actually, one other question. Give some basic strategies for people who have to deal with a narcissistic boss or a narcissistic yeah. partner. What? Give me some yeah, that's, e- easy. That's a challenge. Easy peasy strategy. Yeah, easy peasy. I yeah. mean, there, I don't think there is easy peasy, but general um, narcissistic boss or narcissistic spouse, either one, you you. A lot, we talked about gaslighting earlier. Mm-hmm. You need to get a group of people who support your view of reality. So when you say this is reality and the boss goes, no, that's not real. Your wife or husband say, that's not real. You have a friend who go, no, you're real. They're lying. Um, so you protect yourself. You get a network. The thing with bosses is there's a couple options. One is you hide. One is you get them promoted out. So if they're a real problem, you say, you are so great. You should be working at headquarters. <laughs> Third option is you just do everything for them and kind of ride their coattails as long as you can. That kind of remora with the shark model. Right. Which, and again, whatever your life circumstances are, you kind of suck up to the person or ingratiate yourself to the boss. So they want to have you around. When you look at narcissistic leaders, they always have a little groups of people. They, little, they come around, around with them. Little yeah. quail. Yeah. So you can be a little quail and follow them around. Um, so that's an option. With relationships, you know, get legal help, just get an attorney, get a coach, do whatever you can to protect yourself. Like I said, that you need a support system, especially if you're going to try to work with the marriage. Um, another strategy that people have told me about when they're leaving marriages that are falling apart, or they call it the gray rock strategy, which is being really boring. And I've heard this from friends who I respect. So, I mean, this is, but there's no research on this, but the idea is this partner's like, Hey, we ended the marriage. I still want to have Keith, you know, in my life and I want to mess with him. So you just act really boring, like a gray rock. Just like, yeah, yes. One word answers. Everything's really written down. And you hope the person leaves you alone because they find something more shiny to. To bother. The gray rock syndrome. Yeah. It's like a method they talk about. Be as boring as a gray rock. Because there's nothing. You can't, you can't instigate it. You're not. Yeah. Because what happens is the, the guy oh, we're going to do this. And you're like, ah, and then you're back in the dynamic. And you're like, I left yeah. this marriage and I'm reliving the marriage. Or I a left. girlfriend, boyfriend. It doesn't, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And, 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 and so you're reliving the dynamic. Like, I don't want to be in this dynamic. So I can't be the same person I was in the dynamic. Right. So I have to be a different person. And then why are more men narcissists than women? Um, I think it's basic personality structure with men tend to be more externalizing, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we talk about breaking, you know, like approach and avoidance. We also talk about externalizing and internalizing, which are some people with disorders tend to be more aggressive. They hit things more. They tend to be more alcoholic and some people to be more depressed, internalizing self-harm in general. And there's just a very general, this isn't like everybody, it's just a general, on average, men tend to have more externalizing disorders. Mm-hmm. So if you look at prisons, men's prisons are much bigger than women's prisons. Right. Because right, men right. just, and more prisons aggressive. are filled with narcissists and psychopaths. And um, so I think that there's just a general gender difference in external externalization, and that's part of it. But there also could be some cultural things like men are allowed, you know, you get more props for being kind of arrogant. If you're a woman, you're more arrogant, it's harder, you got to be more subtle about it. Right. Right. It's it called demanding if you're a woman or. Yeah. But so, I do think probably now with social media and this whole individualized world, 
I bet those numbers are yes. going to become much more balanced. I 100% agree with you. With vulnerable narcissism, you see the balance already where mm -hmm. it's equal. It's a grandiosity where there's more. I think it's probably changing. And probably you see the flip with things like borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. histrionism, um, which tend to be diagnosed more in women. And my guess is that gets balanced out too. Because one idea is that if therapists or a psychiatrist will see a woman come in with these traits and go, yeah, you're kind of borderline, but the same man is that you're kind of narcissistic. Right. And the woman, they'll focus more on the emotional d destabilization and the men, it will be more like the power kind of dynamic, but it's the very same or similar disorder. Right. So there's always a cultural piece that comes in you know, always, always, yeah, always. Well, Keith, this has been very informative. I thoroughly enjoyed this podcast with you. It's been very fun for me too. I'm so glad that you came. The book is called The New Science of Narcissism, and you can get it anywhere, I'd imagine, right? Yeah. Amazon. Amazon. That's where everyone buys books. Book store. Your local please, bookstore. Please, please go there? to your bookstore. <laughs> There's none in LA, but we still have one in Georgia. Please go. Really? Wow. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know what bookstore we have? Amazon bookstore. <laughs> You do, right? Probably like an actual store. No, I'm joking. We're, I'm not joking. We have the Amazon really bookstore do. down the street. Well, yeah, you can buy it at Amazon, but. I mean, or yeah. Barnes and Noble. I, think, I mean, we don't have one, but online. Help the entrepreneurs out there. I they know. need it, man. Help the, the entrepreneurs. Help the small business owners. Help the small business owners. They're getting crushed. And I would say follow Keith on in, um, social media, but he's not on social media, but he is on Twitter. Twitter. Twitter he is. I, okay, so you have Twitter. Yeah. Not right. a lot of hot takes coming from no. me. <laughs> no. Oh, well. Um, well, that's called, okay. So Keith Campbell, The New Science of Narcissism. This has been super informative. Thank you. Thank you. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast powered by Habit Nest.